Good evening. My name is Jonathan Kaplan, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies and the director of the Schusterman Center for Jewish Studies here at the University of Texas at Austin. On behalf of the Schusterman Center and our co-organizers for this evening's event, the Clement Center for National Security, I would like to welcome you to this evening's lecture, Atrocity Prevention as a Core National Security Interest and Core Moral Responsibility. Where does U.S. action stand? Before I introduce our speaker uh, for this evening, I just want to make a few notes. Uh, tonight, we're going to do questions using note cards, which have been provided for you uh, at the top of your table, uh, which uh, Simon Gerst will uh, thankfully collect for us at the end, and I'll curate the questions uh, as we move forward. So as you have questions, please feel free to write those down on the card, and they'll be uh, collected uh, at the end of our lecture. Uh, additionally, I would like to thank Emily Petrovsky of the Schusterman Center, uh, and Amber and Elizabeth, uh, Amber Howard and Elizabeth uh, Dotty and Mara of the Clement Center for their work in organizing our speaker's visit to UT. I would also like to thank my colleague, Dr. Paul Edgar, uh, the director at the Clement Center, and Dr. Tatiana Lichtenstein, associate professor in the Department of History and leader of the Schusterman Center's minor in Holocaust and Genocide Studies for their collaboration in organizing this evening's lecture and uh, all of our visitors' uh, uh, events here on campus today. Our speaker, Andrea Gittleman, is the policy director at the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide, where she leads the center's policy outreach and country-specific work, as well as efforts relating to justice and accountability for mass atrocities. Previously, she was interim director of the U.S. Poli of US policy and Senior Legislative Counsel at Physicians for Human Rights, where she designed advocacy and policy strategies on a broad range of international human rights issues, including mass atrocities. Prior to that, she served as an Arthur Helton Global Human Rights Fellow with the Burma Lawyers Council in Mai Sot, uh, Thailand, where she coordinated an international advocacy campaign for justice for mass atrocities in Burma. Prior to attending law school, she served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Mauritania. She received a JD from NYU School of Law and a BA in Political Science and International Studies from the University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Andrea Gittleman. Hello, and, and thank you all for being here tonight. It's a real honor to have been invited. Thank you to the Schusterman Center um, and for the Clement Center for inviting me. I've had a few conversations, including with some of you, and I've just been really impressed by um, the, the thoughtfulness of the students here and um, that issues like this, like atrocity prevention, which is difficult for anyone to talk about, that these are on our minds. And I'm really thankful that we're able to have these discussions today. So I'll speak briefly about the work of the museum and then I'll, I'll get into um, discussing this very long, long title has, has tried to put forward. So thinking about these two rationales around atrocity prevention, that it, it is a um, national security interest and a core moral responsibility. And so we'll speak about those two in turn. So first, you're probably familiar with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, but it was um, created by Congress and serves as a living memorial to the victims of the Holocaust. And the museum teaches that the Holocaust was preventable and that individuals and governments can take effective early warning to, to save lives. The museum's Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide, of which I'm a member, works to stimulate our national conscience and worldwide action to prevent and halt acts of genocide. So when we think about why preventing mass atrocities is so important, we have these two rationales. And for the past two decades, US presidents have consistently reaffirmed that preventing mass atrocities is both a core national security interest and a core moral responsibility. And those two issues are often listed in tandem. It's often one sentence. So I'll speak about them uh, uh, independently first. So first, preventing mass atrocities is a core moral responsibility. And it seems clear that preventing genocide crimes against humanity, uh, just with the sheer devastation that they inflict upon individuals on entire communities, preventing those crimes would be a moral responsibility. And many of the people who who I've met, who I work with, who have dedicated their careers to ending genocide, ending mass atrocities, are people who do so for that very simple, very human conviction that no one should have to experience such, such trauma. And the people who work on atrocity prevention today, whether they're policymakers or activists or scholars, 
They're often people who have experienced mass atrocities firsthand or who have witnessed horrors of genocide in places like Rwanda, the Balkans, or Darfur. And when we zoom out and think about what we as Americans would like our foreign policy to be, we often imagine a mindset that prioritizes peace and security for us and for others around the world. So preventing mass atrocities seems like something that great nations would, would prioritize. We're scarred by our collective failures to prevent genocide and other mass atrocities in the past, and we want to dedicate our resources to more effectively preventing these crimes in the future. This moral imperative to prevent mass atrocities should just be enough to spark deep and sustained foreign policy attention to confronting these horrific crimes. But in addition, mass atrocities also pose serious threats to national security. And it feels odd, in a way, to talk about mass, security, uh, to talk about mass atrocities globally as national security threats. Does our foreign policy establishment care about mass atrocities elsewhere because we think they might someday harm us? Or do we, and we as researchers, students, activists, civil society organizations, do we translate mass atrocities into national security language because we know the information will um, uh, receive a more receptive policy audience? These questions raise some discomfort for me, and I imagine they do for you as well. But in general, I see a push and pull between self-interest and moral clarity that drives decision-making around atrocity prevention. And these two rationales are not mutually exclusive, and options for effective prevention and response kind of borrow a bit from each. I think understanding the interplay between the national security rationale and the moral imperative only helps so much. Because once we've made the case for the importance of atrocity prevention, then what? Then, then what do we do next? Most prevention and response tools come with their own moral questions and their own security risks. So now I'd like to start with a quick audience poll. Um, in 2012, what percentage of Americans said they think it is in the U.S. national security interest to prevent or respond in the event of genocide or mass atrocity? And if you'll indulge me, we'll actually take a poll, do a, a quick show of hands. So is it 26 percent, 41 percent, 56, 71, or 87 percent? Again, this poll was in 2012. Who says it's A? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, who says it's B? Even, okay, C and D and E. That's very interesting, huh? So the answer is D. The answer is D, it's 71%. And the results are quite bipartisan. You can see there at the bottom. So public attitudes about the connection between mass atrocity prevention and national security, kind of, it, it mirrors what experts have been saying for quite some time. I, thought, I found some solace in this, that people kind of make the connection naturally. Um, your, your responses, your, your show of fans, was actually not what I was expecting, but maybe we'll talk about that more later in the Q&A. So 20 years ago, Samantha Power, who is now, of course, the administrator for the U.S. Agency for International Development, wrote that, quote, security for Americans at home and abroad is contingent on international stability. And there is perhaps no greater source of havoc than a group of well-armed extremists bent on wiping out a people on ethnic, national, or religious grounds. And she continues, Western governments have generally tried to contain genocide by appeasing its architects. But the sad record of the last century shows that the walls the United States tries to build around genocidal societies almost inevitably shatter. States that murder and torment their own citizens target citizens elsewhere, end quote. So yes, mass atrocities lead to destabilizing dynamics within countries and across regions. And with the targeting of civilians can come massive displacement and refugee flows into neighboring countries. And then with that displacement, growing risks of, of trafficking, of sexual and gender-based violence, mass atrocities can trigger economic shocks and um, can provide potentially fertile ground for terrorist groups or for other groups who might have hateful or exclusionary ideology. The genocide of the Rohingya in Burma, also called Myanmar, in 2016 and 2017, for example, led to nearly 800,000 people fleeing to neighboring Bangladesh, where refugees continue to live in unstable and, and unsafe conditions. And I've spoken with many Rohingya refugees who expressed a profound sense of hopelessness. They're part of a community of people who have been forced from their homes, and they have no realistic prospect of returning safely home in the future. <laughs> 
the Bangladesh camps are so crowded and have become overrun by criminal gangs who threatened Rohingya for perceived infractions, including um, sharing information about their condition with the outside world. And traffickers have taken advantage of the situation and untold numbers of people have been forced into dangerous and exploitative situations. So I wanna talk a little bit about a Rohingya teenager named Tasmina. She shared her story with us. She's featured in the museum's exhibition, Burma's Path to Genocide. She explains how in Burma, she used to be able to see her friends and act as a normal teenager. And after the, the Burmese military's attacks on her village, she and her family you know, were, were driven to Bangladesh where she is consumed by, by loneliness, by hopelessness. The insecurity of the situation in the camps mean that her parents rarely allow her to leave her small dark room for fear of potential predators in the camps. She's never alone because her shelter is crowded with many other family members, and yet she is cut off from the world. I want to speak a little bit about this flower that you see here. Um, and you see in the background this kind of black and white grid. That was a tarp kind of spread over some bamboo that separated Tasmina from the outside world. So she's literally cordoned off by the bamboo tarp that you can kind of see here. Our photographer and the curator for the exhibition, his name is Greg Constantine. He was not allowed to take her photo because her parents were that scared about her safety and didn't want her, her image and also culturally didn't want to have a Western man to, to, to take her, her photo. So he asked her how she would like to be represented in the exhibition because he wanted to share her story. And she drew this flower for us. And she said, this flower is how I would like to be represented. When you talk about my story, please show this flower. So the transnational gang violence and the trafficking are these issues that keep Tasmina, you know, cordoned off and, and hidden. Um, those are threats that are also security issues and they have intense personal consequences for victims and this is especially profound for women and girls. The forced displacement of Tasmina's family along with the thousands of other Rohingya families who are now living in these sprawling camps in Bangladesh it's created an environment where we have seen criminal networks expand. We've seen extremist groups um, be able to, to, to gather steam. And for Tasmina and so many others, the horrors of the genocide in Burma didn't end there. They now face ongoing insecurity in Bangladesh that reaches far beyond the borders of the camps. And it's worth noting that the effects of mass atrocities on women and girls, as well as other marginalized groups, sexual minorities, people with disabilities, those are usually not the stories that come out to the wider world. And we can't discount the very real and human impact of these crimes and the security implications they trigger. We should be aware that there's usually information about victim and survivor experiences that just isn't making it into the headlines. So I'd like to speak a little bit about the period before the genocide of Rohingya in Burma. The exhibition, Burma's Path to Genocide, that I mentioned earlier, tells the story of this failure to prevent genocide. And it's told through the experience of survivors from a village called Mong Nu, which is in the, the northern part of Rakhine State in the western part of the country. And they, were, they share reflections about what happened before August 27, 2017, what happened on that day, and their lives after. And from them, audiences can learn about the warning signs that were insufficiently addressed in the years leading up to the genocide. The history of the Holocaust teaches us, as I mentioned, that genocide is not inevitable. There are always warning signs. And in the years in the lead up to genocide, in Burma, the country was emerging from military rule. The country was making initial moves toward democracy. The country was opening up to the world and people both inside and outside of the country saw new opportunity. And when I spoke with Rohingya survivors of mass violence back in 2015, People who had been living in internally displaced person camps after being forced from their homes, they expressed hope about what the next few years would bring. And I had conversations with people of all ages who said that they saw hope in the democratic movement. They saw new openness in their country as a way to turn the corner from decades of persecution their community had faced. And people outside Burma shared their hope too. Foreign policies regarding Burma shifted from exclusion to support as countries sought to shore up the, the fledgling democracy. But at the same time, waves of violence continued to target members of ethnic and religious minorities in Burma, including the Rohingya, they're a mostly Muslim community. And there are warning signs, including physical violence and impunity for attacks on civilians, discriminatory policies, and rampant hate speech. There were limited attempts by the international community to mitigate the risk of genocide. And in my opinion, the news out of Burma was made, kind of molded to fit this good news story of democratization.
and violence against the Rohingya was seen as perhaps a, an, an aberration on the road to a better future and nothing that should derail the broader democratic project. But at that point in time, there were civil society leaders and others trying to, to sound the alarm. Um, it felt, felt kind of lonely. Just a few years after I had those conversations with Rohingya survivors who were hopeful about what the following period would bring, the Burmese military committed genocide and crimes against humanity against their community. And the attacks against the Rohingya, as I said, were not inevitable, and they stand as a harrowing reminder of the cost of failed prevention. Perhaps the clearest example of a failure to prevent mass atrocities and its national security implications for the US is the crisis in Syria. The crisis began with mass atrocities and industrial scale disappearance, torture, and execution. The man in this photo here is Mansour Omari, and his story is told in the museum's previous exhibition, Syria, Please Don't Forget Us. He was detained along 82 others in Syria for perceived infractions for opposing Assad or for participating in protests. And mass disappearance is a tactic, still is, of the Assad government, of the Syrian government, and it leaves those detained and their loved ones in anguish. Mansour and his cellmates, they wrote down their names of, uh, they wrote down their own names on scraps of cloth so that if they were to be released, they could tell their family members, they could tell their loved ones where they were. Um, they used rust and their own blood to write their own names on these five strips of cloth which a tailor, cell, a, a tailor cellmate sewed into a coat. And then Mansour, this man here, wore that coat when he was released he shared the list of names with family members who were just desperate to know what happened to their loved ones. When he left his cell, his cellmates pleaded, please don't forget us. What Mansour and his fellow detainees experienced was horrific. And crimes against them and other civilians in Syria were part of a wave of violence and instability that swept the region and posed serious threats to US national security. The conflict in Syria devolved into one of the largest displacement crises since World War II. And the conflict destabilized the region, contributed to the rise of the, the so-called the, the self-proclaimed Islamic State and its targeting of religious minorities, including the genocide of the Yazidi population. As we know, the Islamic State became a serious national security threat as well. The massive refugee flows from Syria to Europe, for example, led to destabilizing anti-immigrant sentiment there and also here in the U.S. As Todd Lindbergh and Lee Feinstein wrote for the Simon Scott Center, quote, we must be wary of the assumption that a situation that begins with a dictator committing atrocities will solve itself rather than escalate into a first order security challenge. There is no more vivid illustration than Syria of how taking action to prevent genocide and mass atrocities is a core collective security interest of the transatlantic community. I'd like to speak briefly about a different mass atrocity case, the case of the Chinese government's attacks on Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims in Xinjiang, China. The U.S. government has determined that the Chinese Communist Party's actions against the Uyghur population constitute genocide and crimes against humanity. And after years of policies that sought to, to forcibly assimilate the Uyghur community, it gave way more recently to new and extreme levels of abuses. The CCP embarked on a massive campaign to disappear and detain Uyghurs, to separate Uyghur men and women, to target the reproductive capacity of Uyghur women, separate children from their families and erase visible elements or representations of Uyghur culture. And all of that was supported by systems of intrusive mass surveillance. Many situations, not all, of genocide or crimes against humanity are marked by mass killing, but the perpetrators in this case are using different abuses to achieve their aims. And the nature of the crimes and also the nature of the perpetrator challenges standard policy responses. Many foreign policy experts understand the threats that the Chinese government poses to national security. Just as one example, the U.S. intelligence community noted in its 2023 threat assessment that, quote, China has the capability to directly attempt to alter the rules-based global order in every realm and across multiple regions. China's crimes threaten millions of Uyghurs, and if they threaten U.S. national, secu national security. This is Rishan Abbas. She's a Uyghur partner whose sister has been detained in Xinjiang. She put it powerfully when she said, quote, this is about the future of the world because China is changing the rule of law. China is basically setting the example for the next world order and Western democracy and its values are at stake here. Her sister remains detained today. The US administration and Congress have repeatedly condemned the Chinese government's mass atrocities against Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims. 
and they've called attention to the dismal human rights record, but at this moment, it's still unclear how preventing mass atrocities features among other policy priorities regarding China. And I'll briefly mention the U.S. response to crimes in Ukraine. This is a situation, of course, that poses significant national security threats. We've seen a robust response from the U.S. to confront mass atrocities by Russian forces against Ukrainian civilians. In addition to extensive military assistance, the U.S. has sanctioned and applied visa bans on Russian officials, launched projects to document mass atrocities, and has dedicated um, uh, support to law enforcement and prosecutors within Ukraine to facilitate investigation and prosecution of crimes against civilians. U.S. leaders have publicly stressed the importance of confronting the horrors of this conflict and to ensuring that those responsible will be held accountable. The case of Ukraine, to me, shows what is possible in terms of a response. Obviously, not all tools will be appropriate for all situations. Um, I think it's worth remembering that places like Cameroon or South Sudan, where civilians continue to face mass atrocities, should be priorities for atrocity prevention and response as well. For example, the government of Cameroon's attacks on Anglophone civilians they threaten U.S. national security interests too, but perhaps not as directly as what we see here. In addition to displacement and economic crisis and violent extremism that emerge from mass atrocity situations, these crimes shake the norms that underpin all of our communities and shake how we believe communities should be protected. If not effectively prevented, mass atrocities chip away at our common humanity. So what more do we need to do? When we look at the trajectory of U.S. foreign policy over the last two decades, there is a lot of progress. The Holocaust Museum, alongside the U.S. Institute of Peace and the American Academy of Diplomacy, launched the Genocide Prevention Task Force. It was chaired by Madeleine Albright and William Cohen. Its final report was published in 2008. It issued many recommendations, including having a standing interagency mechanism to assess mass atrocity risks, and a government-wide policy on genocide and atrocity prevention. And in terms of government process, a lot has improved since then. Today, there is now this dedicated interagency task force where officials from across the U.S. government tackle early warning signs and coordinate effective responses. And the U.S. is part of this global group of countries to coordinate information they're getting and to coordinate on, on response efforts. The Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act, which became law in 2019, requires, among other things, training for foreign service officers on atrocity prevention, and the 2022 state, in 2022, the State Department released its first ever U.S. strategy to anticipate, prevent, and respond to atrocities. So we now have seasoned officials across the U.S. government whose roles are dedicated to preventing mass atrocities. And yet, there are crises around the world where civilians remain at risk of or are currently experiencing large-scale attack. So what more could the U.S. government do? The U.S. government can do more to close this gap between advances in government structure and policy and the impact on communities at risk. One area could be to invest more in improving early warning systems. This would include ensuring that U.S. officials who work in high-risk areas are well-trained in identifying the early warning signs of mass atrocities and that they're able to work closely with civil society in order to gather this information. They should understand the U.S. government's atrocity risk assessment framework and use it to guide their understanding of what risks civilians in a particular context may face. It's also important to strengthen clear channels for this information to be shared with others. The Atrocity Prevention Task Force, that interagency group that I mentioned, it coordinates an all-of-government approach to preventing mass atrocities, and that's helpful in moving all of these ideas forward but also government officials who do not sit on the task force, but who are making policy decisions about high risk context should also be steered by early warning information and an understanding of atrocity prevention resources. Those officials would also need to be well versed in the tools for atrocity prevention, as well as what has worked, where and when. As the Simon Scott Center detailed in a recent report, the administration can do a lot more to collect lessons from past mass atrocity cases in order to shape more effective responses in the future. And Congress can do a lot more to hold the administration to account, including by holding public hearings on how the administration is responding to early warning signals, how they are learning from past prevention efforts, how they're responding to demands from victims and survivors for justice, 
Congress can also dedicate more funding to specific atrocity prevention related lines of effort. And what more can the American people do? We can demand much more from our leaders. We can demand that preventing genocide and other mass atrocities be a key pillar of our foreign policy and not a side project. We can also demand that the resources, expertise, and tools on atrocity prevention within the US government can apply in the many contexts in which civilians are at risk of mass atrocities and that our leaders learn from past experience in order to shape more effective policies in the future. The Genocide Prevention Task Force report from uh, 2008 that I mentioned, it also has a recommendation for the American people that we quote, build a permanent constituency for the prevention of genocide and mass atrocities. And that was written four or five years following genocide in Darfur, a place that became a household term across the country because of dedicated efforts from the American public to call attention to genocide there. And a lot of those efforts from the Save Darfur movement from about 20 years ago came from young Americans, especially students. 20 years later, civilians across Sudan and especially in Darfur are again facing the risk of mass atrocities. And as the museum had noted earlier this year, civilians in Darfur face the risk of genocide yet again. And the crimes we're seeing now echo the brutality of the crimes 20 years ago. So just to conclude briefly, both policymakers and the American public face this challenging moment. Civilians across the world face mass atrocities. Survivors continue to struggle to have their voices heard and justice served. And information about early warning of mass atrocities is not always fully appreciated. And some of the tools for atrocity prevention remain insufficiently resourced and understood. And none of that is good. We have a long way to go to meet the needs of so many around the world who face the threat of genocide or, or of crimes against humanity. And we have seen progress in terms of building the infrastructure within the US government to anticipate and respond appropriately to mass atrocities, and that is important. There's now this community of dedicated professionals within our government who have the training and structure to promote effective atrocity prevention policy. There's more to do, yes, but we've come a long way. And I'd like to end on a note of hope. Um, in this job, I've had the immense honor of working alongside survivors of mass atrocities. I recently spoke with a friend and a colleague, she's a human rights activist in Burma, and she and so many young women across the country are not giving up on democracy and human rights for the people of Burma. And despite the horrors that she and her community have faced and continue to face, she is redoubling her efforts to galvanize young people in Burma to work towards a better future. She's working to strengthen community level responses to violence and to promote accountability, to make sure local officials are responsive to the needs of the people. That's a tall order. She hasn't given up, so neither can we. I'm going to end there and I look forward to taking some questions. I had one uh, to start off while we're, we're uh, collecting questions that folks have. And it relates to kind of, uh, you know, I was one of the people that raised my hand at, I think it was 21% uh, of support. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 and it struck me um, that part of that, from my perspective, was not that people think the U.S. should intervene, but that the U.S., uh, there's a lack of, of interest in supporting intervention uh, or the things that need to be done ahead of time so that we don't get to the stage of genocide. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think you alluded to that a bit in the end uh, of, of, of your lecture. And I was wondering if you could elaborate more on, uh, on why you think there's the disjunction between really we should 73, 74% of Democrats and Republicans less for independence think we should support intervention in genocide moments, but much less think we should be doing the kind of groundwork stuff that would help us not get to that moment of mm -hmm. needing to intervene. Sure. And, and if you could sure. elaborate on that, that'd be great. Sure. I think... Um probably what you saw in that poll reflects a lot of how governments operate when there are so many crises all the time. And so you're trying to address country X and then something else happens somewhere else and you turn from crisis to crisis. And it's hard to take that entire machine and say, that's important. But in addition to all your work there, also take a step back and look at places that where there's no mass killing or mass atrocities now, but where the situation might get worse down the road a couple of years from now. That requires a real shift of focus. Um, and that can be hard to do. A lot of the people working on these issues in government have uh, big portfolios, they're trying to do many things, they might not have a lot of time or extra resources. 
So it takes a lot, you know, a lot of the, the um, progress that I mentioned is about making sure there are dedicated people, dedicated conversations that look more upstream. Because I think if you, if you were to ask people, should we wait until a situation gets bad to respond or should we respond earlier? They probably say respond earlier, but that doesn't happen naturally. That happens when you have dedicated resources and structures and staffing and all of that sounds not so interesting, but without it, the work can't happen. Um, but there's a whole lot of work that I think needs to be done to kind of change the footing from crisis response, from the oh no moments to let's take a step back. What are we watching here? Everyone, you know, all foreign service officers all over the world at various embassies, they should all be looking at this, you know, over time. They become experts in, in their country. They should know what are some worrying signs that I've seen develop over the past year, over the past two years? What should we do with this information? What are some things that we could watch? And I think having that kind of framing um, can really, really help and for maybe get us off of this, you know, crisis to crisis footing. Thank you. And just to follow up on that, uh, um, you know, one place uh, um, has to do with the, the genocide in Rwanda. Uh, and the current genocide in, in the Congo, one questioner asks, is related to the aftermath of the Rwanda genocide. And what can the U.S. do after a genocide to make sure it doesn't lead to another? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, one of the key indicators of future risk of mass killing is a previous mass killing in that country. So I think um, making sure that past um, uh, grievances are addressed in healthy, respectful, responsible, responsible ways is important to kind of stemming that, that cycle. Because I think we've seen this in a, a number of places. Rwanda DRC is, is one. Um, but in a lot of places, you know, it's even after uh, official conflict ends, there's still incredible work that needs to be done on the prevention side and from others. So thinking about the demands of, of victims, of survivors, um, we shouldn't then turn away like, oh, the, the war is over, there's a ceasefire, let's look somewhere else, but let's, let's go on to the next crisis. And it kind of, uh, you know, just um, bridges to what we're, we're talking about a moment ago with shifting to this more upstream or prevention focused footing, but also not turning away, also remaining invested in how, you know, this marginalized community that has been attacked, what is their situation now? And we need to keep watching and keep an eye out for some of those uh, potential you know, warnings that perhaps violence could emerge again. That also takes a lot of work to kind of keep that, that focus on. Great, thank you. Uh, one of the questions which has been posed relates to human rights law and how it fits in with atrocity prevention and national security and moral imperative equation. How, mm -hmm. how do you uh, locate uh, international standards and legal standards on these matters in, in this kind of question of prevention of mass atrocities? Sure, in terms of, of early warning, perhaps. Yeah. Um, right, so there's human rights law. I think specific violations of human rights law would be um, examples of potential early warning signs. So if you're looking at uh, you know, ways in which um, you know, populations might be facing persecution, might be facing um, uh, certain forms of discrimination, those are signs to watch over time that could help inform prevention efforts. A trust prevention more generally, um, I think borrows a lot from human rights law, a bit from international humanitarian law, a bit from just other parts of international law. Um, but in the end, it's about enforcing norms around prevention and the, the imperative of, of preventing mass atrocities and for, for you know, protecting civilians at risk. And I think that norm comes from a number of different areas of law. So uh, uh, what, uh, what book recommend recommendations might you make uh, on understanding and preventing genocide and mass atrocities? Great, great question. Um, I would recommend the book Fundamentals of Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention. And from the title, you can probably <laughs> guess what it's all about. Uh, but it's written by Professor Scott Strauss. Uh, it's published by the museum. So maybe I'm a little bit biased, but it really does a good job of showing you know, what are some of the early warning signs, what are the, the moments of escalation, the triggers, the tools, um, how do we think about um, different responses, uh, what should governments take into account when they're, they're coming up with these strategies for prevention. So I'd highly recommend that book. It's available on the museum's website for free. 
Um, also, this, this book, I think it's a helpful glimpse into the past. It's from 2008, which now seems like a really long time ago. But this predates just a lot of the kind of administrative, what I said is not very interesting, but is very important changes that have happened since then. So read this task force report and get a sense of, at that moment, when there was a stock taking of what needed to be done in terms of the US government response to, to mass atrocities, you can see how far we've come and, and how there really still is, is so much more to do. So I'd recommend that as well. Great, thank you. So one of the questions, uh, which I think one of our questioners is, is raising, is the question of po politics into mass atrocity prevention. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, there are moments when uh, people who might be, for instance, China is uh, uh, an easy target for the U.S. to allay concern for because we're not necessarily allies with China. Uh, how do you, how do how does the U.S. negotiate or how is it doing in terms of uh, addressing allies that it might have in parts of the world and concerns about atrocity or uh, um, mass casualty events and yeah. how the U.S. negotiates that? Yeah, and that's a really good point. Um, it's often easier to point out mass atrocities in certain contexts and not others. Yeah. Um, but there are, if you, the, our early warning project, we, we look at, at countries at high risk of, of future mass killing. And there are some US allies on that list. India has been high on that list for, since 2014, since we started the list, just as one example. And so when we think about you know, atrocity prevention efforts and the reports that the administration sends to Congress about everything they're doing, they're talking about Ukraine and China and Afghanistan. Um, but I think it's maybe for all of us, for civil society and for the American public to say, what are you doing on, on South Sudan? No one's asking you about South Sudan and they really should because the, the crimes there are extremely serious. What are you doing about India? You know, there are many um, policy priorities the US has with India, but how does atrocity prevention feature among them? Where, where is that in, in the ranking of, of our priorities? I think there can be just as one example, a lot that we can do to press for um, a, a more global approach to this, even when it's difficult. So one area that's uh, been an area of, of concern, obviously, late in the media is, is Israel's conflict in Gaza with Hamas. Uh, and there's been a, a lot of use of terms related to atrocity prevention within that. And I would just, well, you're here, and certainly that's a topic. And uh, we've, I've heard you answer this question already several times today, but um, I, I would love to have you kind of reflect upon uh, how you might em employ this framework in thinking about this current conflict. Sure. I think it's... Um, what's well, a devastating conflict, and I think it touches many of us. Um, I think just starting from recognizing that there is such severe harm and trauma on multiple sides here, and um, often terms are used because they reflect our, our feelings and our emotions, and I think that's understandable. Um, but what is important, I think, for the museum as an educational institution um, we think about genocide or crimes against humanity or war crimes, so they have specific definitions. Um, and for us, we don't work specifically on the conflict. We don't work on Israel and Palestine. But I think just understanding that people are um, uh, desperate for answers and want to see just the, the stop to, to civilian suffering. Um, and I think starting from a place of compassion and understanding makes sense. I also think looking at legal definitions in this case, but in so many others is often an unhelpful question because there are many forms of human suffering that don't fit these exact definitions. Um, and so instead of using shorthand terms to express horror or um, uh, you know, uh, concern about what is happening, I think recognizing just the very human element of what is happening and the legal definitions have a purpose and perhaps are not, um, uh, that it, it just seems like a different, a different question to, to answer here that might not be as helpful. Well, thank you so much, Andrea Gittleman, for that and for all of your wisdom tonight. Um, I don't think there are any more questions that have been handed in, uh, but we're deeply grateful for your time here and please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you.